Now, t today I'd like you to introduce you to Tila. She's a medicine woman. She knows a lot about our culture and our dances. And she's just, in general, a good person to get knowledge from. <laughs> I think that today, in the Western world, that it's important to teach our children to learn ceremonies, to be able to learn to pray. Because through our peoples, coming down from Kadami, amongst the Karuk people, we always had a ceremony for our children. And it seems like that ceremony played a big, part, big role in their life. And it seems like when we had our ceremonies, our children <coughs> carried the respect. They didn't run over top of their parents and treat their elders with respect because they learned the respects is through their ceremonies, through prayer, through the gentleness. And today we don't have that. Today our young children don't have that today. And I think that for our children to learn to, re to have respect, that we adults have to be their teachers instead of examples and to show them. But I think that once we start teaching our children and to bring them into more of the spiritual ways, the ceremonies, and workshops that adults go to, that I think it's important that we draw our children there too and not just always leave them at home and put them in the background where they're not seen, where they're not heard. Because the way we was taught as American Indians is that our children traveled with their parents, they traveled with their adults because their learning was to be able to see, to be able to hear, to be able to watch. We didn't have the Western life like we have today where we're taught that the children stays home while the adult goes to a meeting or goes to a ceremony. And today I think it's really hard because our young children don't have that today. And it's like our young people ask us, what do we have for ceremonies? What can we do? How come, how come no other kids my age is in the ceremonies? And I think that once we start pulling and drawing more of our young kids, then we're going to start seeing the respect that our children should have and because that's what's going to teach them to respect, not only to respect other people, but to respect themselves, to carry themselves in a humble manner. And today we don't have that. So ours is a hands-on culture. We don't see and learn, we do and learn. Mm -hmm. So when we cook or sew or do anything, a long time ago we used to pray or sit by a brook and do acorn soup and, and make baskets all at the same time. And mm -hmm. it took a long time. We'd spend a lot of time working and always in prayer. Mm -hmm. And today you run out the door, you go to school, and it's full of, of, we fill their time with TV or anything, anything else to keep them out of our hair. Mm -hmm. So we as parents have to stop and take our kids out into the wilderness or out by a river and let them experience the, hearing the sound of a brook or the sight of a bird or... I mean, children like at the housing, they'll throw rocks and kill little animals for no reason because they don't have no understanding of what life is, life and death. Mm -hmm. They don't understand anymore. It's, and then elders can walk by and they don't stop to help them or they make rude remarks. So we need to get back to teaching respect through our culture, or mm -hmm. getting back to where we should be. But us, us as parents are not even there. You know, we need to have respect and learn discipline. How do we learn discipline? We were taught a long time ago and the way 
even my grandma, Bessie Tripp, and even the way my dad tells me. Howard says, you know, when you children was little, one thing our Indian people never did is we never hit and spanked our children. Because when we start abusing our children, then we start abusing a part of us. And my grandma used to say, you know, this is why it's so important to have aunties and to have uncles. Because the aunties and the uncles would correct our children, would discipline our children. And then that way, through them disciplining our children, then they had the respect for their mom and their dad. And today we don't have that. Today we don't have the aunties and uncles to come and to discipline our children. And to say, listen to your mom, listen to your dad, or your dad's talking to you. And we have to take the responsibility upon ourselves. Do we spank our children because they don't have no discipline? They don't listen to us? No. What we have to do is sometimes we have to get down to their level. And sometimes we adults and little children and trying to discipline them. And what we always done as Indian people, we always got down to their level. We always had that eye contact. We never had anybody looking up to us. And with the children, and we're trying to discipline them, and we stand there in front of them and they're looking up at us. And we're looking down upon them. It's like we're downgrading our children. So we used to do a long time ago, and I, even today I do it with my children. I set them down and I get down to their level, and I talk to them. And we learn how to discipline our children by getting down to their level. And once we, sometimes in this, human beings has to be, as adults, has to be humble enough to humble ourselves in front of our children and to get down to their level. And once we can learn to do that, then our children is going to only look at us, not only as parents, but as a friend. Mm -hmm. Because we are always going to be able to get down to their level, no matter what discipline that we have to go through. And I think if more of our people today would get down to our children, our young people's level, and talk to them on their level, that you're going to see a change about our children today. You know, and I have a hard time this times that sometimes my teachers or my elders can be taller than me. And I have to look up to them and it's like, they're way up here on a pedestal and I'm just way down here like a little tiny bug. You know, why don't you come down to my level so I can have that eye contact. And that's something with our Indian people and with children. We always had the eye contact because it's like we could see the spirit. And when you have that eye contact with our children, then it's like you're not looking at the physical body, but you're looking beyond that. And it's like something from the heart touches them because we are able to get down to their level. When you were younger, when you had the dance and the dances, how old was you when you started to dance in the dances? When I started dancing in our brush dances, I was seven years old. When I had, I was very lucky out of eight of us kids because my grandma had a, I had a brush dance done for me. And it's a whole experience that a child experienced because when they do a brush dance, they say that it's a healing ceremony for the children. But the person that asks for it is put in the middle of the pit with the medicine woman. And they would do it, do, do this brush dance for children that are children who are hard to discipline, children that are having tormenting dreams, children that um, is sick. Then they would have the brush dance, and they would do a whole healing ceremony. And when the men and the women and the medicine person came together, and they only went out and got the young girls that was virgin, and they would allow the girls to dance. So with me, at the age of seven, I was very lucky 
to be able to brush dance and to be able to take a part of that ceremony because I think that that's what even today plays a big part of my life. And a lot of our children today don't have that opportunity to go into a brush dance because most of our children, when our children are hard to be disciplined, our people, it says, you know, maybe there's something that got put on them. So they would come together in a spiritual way and doctor them and pray for them. And it wasn't just for the child that was in that pit. They would bring all kinds of children and people would come together. And even the ones that would be sitting outside of the pit, they would call their children, you know, bring your children. Because through this dance, it also will help those children. And today, for me, it still plays a big part in my life because it's like I get lonesome for the old people. I get lonesome for the brush dance. I get lonesome from the way it used to be for me. So even listening to Uncle Charlie or Kelsey or the old people singing, it's like it brings me back to that brush dance. It makes me draw back upon that ceremony, back upon that experience that I had. And it's like when you're down there and as a young girl, it's like you come to a life. It's like the whole gentle touch of the spirit just comes and moves you. And it's like another part of life takes over. And I always used to think, you know, how can these young girls dance all night without getting tired? Because it seems like young kids have to go to bed early. But yet you have young people dancing in the brush dance all night long. And you wonder, how can these kids stay up? How can they stay awake and just keep going? But it's like when you're down there and that medicine woman's making the medicine and putting herbs on the sacred fire and praying for you. It's like she is the key to carry us through that dance. It's like the creator moves his hands and touches each one of us and just lifts us up. When I see them dance all night long, as I watch them at the very beginning, they have a lot of energy and they're in the flesh a lot more than by the next morning. It seems like all of the flesh is gone and there's only thing that's keeping them going is spirit. And I can see where the medicine would be made strong in the morning when all their flesh is gone and, and the spirit is so strong because that's all the only thing that's keeping them on their feet. Mm-hmm. See when we when we brush dance, like we start out Thursday night and we just kind of we don't hardly bring any of our regalia out. It's just simple. There's no regalia. The young girl stands on the opposite side by the wall while the men are coming in to the pit and the medicine woman and the child. And the first night of the brush dance is just plain. There's no regalia, there's no feathers, there's nothing. And they come in together and that's the starting of the ceremony because that's that physical part. Because in our ceremony, our elders teach us that we work on the physical on the spiritual and on the emotions and on the physical level they say that we human beings will walk into the sacred pit as physical people but all of our animal people and the bird people and everything that we use in our sacred dances would dance with us and among us so then thursday night they would dance all night and then it's friday when this that dawn then they stopped and they didn't dance Friday because they would rest they would allow those young children to rest and to let that medicine work for the first night the Saturday night would come Saturday at dawn they would start dancing again and then that's when you see the best regalia the best dresses the best hats the best shelves everything came out and they're bringing the physical and the spiritual together and that's what carries the young people through that sacred dance.
is because we're bringing in all of our relations, all of the herbs, all of the feathers, all of the basket material and the hides. We're bringing all of that in. So they are dancing with us and carrying us through. I've seen like the children, when they do dances, just the demonstration dances, this isn't the ceremony, but the clothing that they put on to do the dance, they just kind of take them off and throw them around. And somehow we need to get the teaching back to the kids to respect the, the regalia, the, the clothing that they're wearing because it's alive, it's got a spirit of its own, uh, to respect the animals and the plants to offer an offering before they take something and not always have this give me, it's a give me generation, mm -hmm. me first, give me, but somehow to get back to teaching the children to take only once they've given. Mm -hmm. That's kind of why we like to do the tapes, is to teach the kids and to get on tape now for the future generation to somehow impart spirit to them. Because I think I never had any of the dances or any of the teachings of being about my culture at all. And to walk, I mean, I think I walked in a life uh, without spirit. And then when I was 23, Spirit came alive, and and up until that time, I had no awareness. And and I kind of want to see the kids get awareness when they're young, mm -hmm. not when they're 23.